The Dark Fucking mm. Crystal. This was not one of my favorites when I was little, because for many years, I never saw it. What I did see was the trailer, because the other Jim Henson movie that we did have was Labyrinth. I think I've watched the DVD special features on that movie about uh, twice as many times as the actual movie, but that's another review for another day. The Labyrinth DVD also had a set of trailers, and one was obviously The Dark Crystal. This trailer is the epitome of nostalgic wonder for me. For years, this was all I had of the Dark Crystal. A world so familiar yet detached from our own, vague, cryptic magic, a sweeping soundtrack, and part of its allure is that it was only a trailer. I could literally only imagine what all of this imagery was. Then one day, we were in a blockbuster. Yeah, I know, I'm a fossil. And all of my dreams were about to be realized. So, even if you know nothing else about the Dark Crystal, you should all know that it scarred a lot of people who saw it as children. The scene most people refer to as nightmare fuel is when the podling is being drained of its living essence. But that's not what I found the most terrifying. Because I didn't see it. I actually got so scared and stopped watching it after this. So these swords clashing were in the trailer, I don't know what I was expecting, but in the moment after seeing the true horror of these still very impressive puppets, I couldn't handle it. How was I supposed to know they were just gonna hit a rock? Who makes swords and then thinks, hmm, you know what these would be real good for? Hitting a rock! The stakes in the original movie seemed really intense, didn't they? Like when the Chamberlain lost the trial, it was so unnerving how the rest of the Skeksis gathered around him, how he howled and screeched in agony, when all they really did was rip the clothes off of him. Obviously, knowing about the lore of the Skeksis and how their social group functions, this derobing becomes a lot more powerful, but even without knowing that, it's like a torture scene. In saying that though, after seeing the Netflix prequel Age of Resistance, the Skeksis had really lost their edge, hadn't they? I used to think having all of your robes and possessions torn from you was the worst thing these guys could have done to each other. Nope. 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 Oh my f- They upped the scares and creep factor in this prequel to heights I could not have imagined. Both for just how palsy they were to include a lot of this imagery, but also because I literally could not have imagined it. The minds behind the Dark Crystal are paragons of visionaries pioneers of visual delight and disgust, and such a vast network of talent that we are frankly privileged to be able to witness their creation. You may think I'm exaggerating for the sake of sounding intelligent with my verbose lexicon, which I am. I mean, look at what I've been watching, can you blame me? Prevaricator! Ocular castigation! Oh, public mixtruition! But I really do think that the artistry and imagination bursting from every frame of Age of Resistance is something that everyone should see. Let's begin where all great stories must. The beginning. The Dark Crystal began as a project between Jim Henson, Frank Oz, and the ingenious artist Brian Froud. Jim Henson played a big role in many people's childhoods with the Muppets, but Froud was one of my biggest inspirations as a young artist and lover of fantasy, since we own a copy of one of his art books called Fairies. But back to the Dark Crystal. After the feature film became a cult classic, dozens of other wonderful artists lent their hand to this ever-expanding world. I mean, just, just look at this. Nine books to prepare you. Nine! Which I have not read a single one of. So do not expect me to know every single detail about the Dark Crystal's world, like the complex origin story of the Urskex before landing on Thra, or how the specifics of seasons work on a planet that has three suns, which, yes, there is information on, because the mythos of this world is more expansive than the Mariana Trench. Obviously, I've done research, both to create this script and also out of my own fascination for this fantasy world, but I'm not here for the backstory of the backstory. I'm here for Age of Resistance the newest incarnation, a merging of veteran artists with cutting-edge talent. So Age of Resistance is another prequel story directed by Louis Leterrier with the Jim Henson Company, detailing the events that lead up to the movie. Knowing that, everything that happens in it is bittersweet, to say the least. But let's say you haven't seen the movie or the show. Let's say you have literally no idea what any of this is and you've just been scared and confused this entire video. That's okay, just take Mama Koi's hand, we'll drop right into episode one and see what happens. We begin the way every story should, with a Sigourney Weaver narration. 
right out of the gate, we get way more information than the movie ever gave us. Here's a crash course. This is a planet. It's called Thra. The source of all of its power is not the Dark Crystal, but rather the Crystal of Truth. A creature named Agra protects the crystal and Thra's inhabitants. The dominant species on the planet, Gelflings, exist in seven clans. They used to live in perfect harmony, and then aliens came. These reptilian monsters called Skeksis basically tricked Agra into astrally projecting herself to explore the cosmos for thousands of years, and so ruled in her absence and built a castle around the crystal. Their benevolent nature was stripped away as time dragged on, and they began experimenting on the crystal in hopes of obtaining immortality. And the way they attempt to do this and its ramifications is the center of Age of Resistance story. Given that this prequel is right before the near extinction of the Gelflings, we have an entire planet filled with them to meet. This video will not cover every character I want to talk about, but will serve as a launching point. Agra, the best character in the entire show. I think it's important to mention her first, since she is one of the most important beings on Thra, because she is Thra. From Brian Froud's The World of the Dark Crystal, quote, Of the race of Agra, I am alone, the first and last. Born from the need for rocks and trees for an eye to see the world, slowly the roots split the rock, and I was free. She was literally birthed from the soil of the planet. Basically a nature goddess, all of her senses are finely tuned to Thra. Who could have guessed that of this brusque and capricious hag from the original? While yes, she is very blunt and curmudgeonly, she's also respectful to a fault, unfathomably wise, and above all else, maternal. She is even known as Mother Agra to the Gelflings, who she spent her life with in rapture and merriment during Thra's first era, the Age of Innocence. She often inserts herself into the conflicts of the various characters, warning of prophecies and attempting to guide others along the right path. But if they resist... Oh, well, Agra tried. Plans may clash and wars may wage, but Thra is her true concern. Creatures will die, but they return to the planet. The classic circle of life stuff. She accepts how fate aligns itself, but feels real pain with those suffer around her. When she sees the heinous acts performed on the Gelflings, it's truly heart-wrenching how she sobs. This gruff and surly creature who always handles herself with the utmost hubris, pleading for ways to atone for her mistakes, is enough to shake me to my core. There is much more to say about her, but let's move on to the next character. Brea, the best character in the entire show. She is a veteran princess, think like the High Elves of Gelfling society, and the youngest of three. She starts out a little tropey, you know, the bookish child who wants nothing more than to learn all that she can. Oh, why don't they like questions? How else do we learn? Now I have more questions. But it's her search for knowledge that makes her a great character. She wants truth above all else, which helps uncloud her mind from idolizing the Skeksis and actually ask questions about their rule. Her introduction is at the end of this amazing minute-long shot of unbroken visual splendor, toiling over books and manuscripts to the point she has ink smeared on her face. Her elder sister Tavra comes to tell her that their mother has agreed to let Brea attend a tithing ceremony with the Skeksis, and her sheer joy is, to say at the least, poignant, just knowing what hell the future must hold in the series. It's not until finally meeting two Skeksis herself and the tithing ceremony going less than ideal that she starts to question the Skeksis. Afterwards, she revisits manuscripts for the origin of various Skeksi ceremonies and laws, and proposes that they may not be what they seem. To that, the librarian says, Don't go down this path. Which, considering how the original film starts, may have been a more telling warning than either of them could have known. Brea further solidifies herself as one of my favorites as the show continues, but let's move on to our next female lead. Dietra, or just Diet, is the best character in the entire show. She is a grotten golfling living deep underground in bioluminescent caves. Something I love is that the creators of the show actually cared about the physical attributes of the Gelfling clans and how they differ based on their habitat. Thus, she has these large ears to hear the echoes throughout the caves, and those big, beautiful eyes to see clearly in the dark. Deet is a carefree animal lover who takes daily flights over herds of Nurlocks to deliver their food. She's completely unaware of the conflicts above ground, or really anything above ground. What's a star? Her concerns are only of family and the well-being of the animals. 
While her naivete to the topside world leads her to run-ins with dangerous creatures and blatant racism, she's never one to just roll over and take injustice. When her friend is in prison, she doesn't rest until they are freed. When she's told the world is in peril and is bestowed a prophetic destiny, she leaves her home to embark on a dangerous quest in a foreign land. She is incredibly innocent and at times ignorant, but she would sooner sacrifice herself than let evil prevail. When Deed eventually leaves her home to adventure topside, she encounters a giant spider creature called an Aratham. Up till this point, she has lived in peace with all animals she's ever known. I mean, aside from a big MacGuffin Nurlock that we'll discuss at some other point. So is it really a surprise that she would try to introduce herself? She's not really a fighter. But luckily, her rescue comes scampering on tiny feet. Meet Hup, the best character in the entire show. His encounter with Eratham goes less than favorable at first, but his spitfire gumption doesn't wane for a moment. Hup is a podling, the only other well-known species throughout this series and the first movie. They are portrayed as happy-go-lucky lushes who lead simple lives. Even though Gelflings are said to be closest to Thra, podlings take that title literally. They live amongst the trees and mud and love every second of it. Podlings are seen as less cultured, and the quite patronizing and holier than thou Vapor Clan will describe them as. That is oh. that filthy creature in all of Thra than the Podling. Which brings me back to Hup. From the moment he appears on screen, you immediately know that he's special. First of all, they deliberately made the whites of his eyes more prominent when most podlings are shown to just have black eyes. This allows us to see more emotion and thought from him. Next, out of every podling we've ever seen, he is the only one to show ambition. He wants to be a paladin and serve the highest of royalty, with his spoon that he insists is a sword. <laughs> I mean, podlings aren't a warring species. I'm not sure that he knows the real difference, at least at first. <laughs> and beyond that, his most standout feature is that he knows English. Deet. Always beautiful. Now, we don't know how Hup learned English. We actually know nothing about his past. What we do know is that he had the drive and commitment to deviate from the rest of the podlings and craft his own future, to learn another language and venture out from his village. Possibly the first podling to ever learn another language. Plenty of laughs and tears are to be had with Hup, but it's time to introduce just two more characters, at least for now. Rian and Mira. The first Gelflings you meet. Two guards of the Crystal Castle bullying some poor slaves who are just trying to transport food. I'm not a fan. Like, okay, as main characters, yes, I do root for them to win, I sympathize with their traumas, and I want to see them come out the victors. But their opening scenes don't paint the best picture. Which I suppose is the point if you want a character to change and grow, but I didn't have to wait to like the rest of the characters I mentioned. Rian is a Stonewood Gelfling, known for their warriors, while Mira is a Vaprin like Brea, which could be seen as a taboo relationship, considering this poor minor character gets put into humiliating manual labor by her parents for just flirting with a boy from another clan. But that aspect of their relationship is never explored. I actually had to look up if Mira was Vaprin, because until writing the script and realizing she has white hair, it never even passed my mind. I guess a forbidden romance would be a little tropey and cliched, so it's fine that they didn't add that in. But don't you worry, we get plenty of other tropes and cliches to fill in for it. But father... Captain. So many scenes with them in episode one are just filled with such lazy storytelling and dialogue. Seriously, I implore anybody that's put off by them like I was, just keep watching. I swear, it gets so much better from here on out. Let, let's just look at their first scene alone together. Bring to the spyglass! Last one, there's a black Oh my god, are you fucking serious? There are few things that instantly take me out of a fantasy world as much as slapping some fictitious jargon on an English idiom. And you decide to put that in your first episode with one of the first scenes that you introduce two of your main characters? Okay, okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they race to where they were going, and look, Mira won because she has wings. Although, did she really win? Like, literally. He got there first while having to use the stairs. Here's a little retrospective from the first movie. The original gave you very little information. In fact, it gave you too little information. 
but where you did get world building, they always gave you just enough. Here's what I mean. Female Gelflings are revealed to have wings in the original by this simple exchange. I don't have wings. Of course not. You're a boy. So succinct, so straightforward. And how did they do it in the prequel? You won because you have wings. Of course I do. I'm a girl. And you're a flat-footed <sighs> lepre. Okay, 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 I don't know. Maybe you think it's fine. Maybe it's just me. But if I was writing it, I would have gone with a different line like, I don't know, just one of the perks of being a girl. Or, it's not my fault boys don't have wings. The line, because I'm a girl, feels contextualized specifically towards the audience. Like those words were picked out in that order to explain to new viewers that female girlfriends have wings and males don't, without caring about the in-universe context that both characters obviously already know this. Beyond how they're written in the first episode, Rian and Mira are also the lowest on my tier list for their puppetry. Oh, it's still technically fantastic, but follow me into the next segment and I'll explain what I mean. So you've been watching this video with your own two eyes. You can see for yourself the show is a spectacle. There are so many videos online showing all of the amazing ways that they brought the show to life. Just. Google Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, boom, there it is. Go watch all of them, they're all amazing. But you've probably also noticed something that's a little off. And it's exactly the same problem the first movie had. There's only so much you can do with a puppet, specifically a puppet like these. You can't have complex articulated lip movements. Even if they did, I have a feeling the Uncanny Valley effect would take us out of it even more than the lip flapping already does. They do use CG and I think they specially made certain puppets for certain expressions, but they use it sparingly, as they should. Now obviously, the problem with the mouths did not take me out of the show that much given that I'm making this review to begin with, and I'm glad they used puppets instead of CG because there is something so beautiful and authentic about seeing something that's physically there. These puppets are tangible objects, and it helps you envision the rest of the world as a tangible place. But Rianne and Mira's faces in particular just rub me the wrong way. And I think I know why it is. Since Gelfling faces don't have a whole lot of movement, their mouths have to be smiling and frowning at the same time. It's very subtle, expert craftsmanship to get that look down. Not every Gelfling has what I would consider a balanced smile to frown ratio, but most of them do. What will complete an expression and trick your brain into seeing that mouth as a smile or a grimace is the eyes and especially the eyebrows. I don't know if Gelflings technically have eyebrow hair, but you can definitely see on a character like Brea those very pointed brow bones. Now look at Rhiannon and Mira. They have bangs! So you can't even see their freaking eyebrows! There's another prominent Gelfling that also has bangs that obscure her expression, but she's meant to be a shifty character where you're never quite sure where her head's at or what she's going to do next. Rianne and Mira are introduced quite clearly as protagonists. We'll even be following the former throughout the entire show! Rianne always seems to have these bedroom eyes. And when he is being flirtatious and the puppeteers are intentionally giving him that sort of look, it's even creepier. Even worse, his aforementioned smile to frown ratio is way fucking off. The trick to getting that double expression is having the corners of the mouth slope downwards and then slope back up very subtly right at the corners, or the other way around, sloping up and hooking down. This cannot be seen as anything other than a creepy smile. This figurine looks better. These artists are professionals who know what they're doing and do it better than anyone. How did this end up being the final draft for their main character? On the flip side, we've got a character like Brea. I think her design is absolutely fantastic. My eyes are drawn to her in almost every scene she's in. Best of all, she has the benefit of the most expressive eyebrows of any character in the show. Even when completely neutral, they are raised high on the forehead and pointed inwards, which makes every emotion look more intense and imbued with empathy. I mean, both of these characters are about to learn the answers to all of their troubles that they've been searching for through perilous journeys for days. Which one looks more excited? 
Permanently upturned eyebrows is actually a design choice to make you feel more sympathetic towards a character. It is, for lack of a better term, cute. I mean, just look at Marina from Splatoon 2. I did it! I found a way to make this relevant to the rest of my channel! And is it just me, or do Brea's eyes physically move more than any other character? I mean, here's a detail I'm sure none of you noticed. And it was intentional for none of you to notice. When Brea looks down, her eyelids travel with her gaze. Let me tell you a little story. One of my favorite things to do is 3D eye animation. I've actually attended seminars from Pixar animators about the nuance and intricacy of facial animation. Like where you point your eyes, indicates what you're thinking. No same blink happens twice. You blink when you turn your head. These aren't things you think about, it's just things you do. Animation is capturing life by understanding the complex facets of the simplest of expressions, and it's the exact same in puppetry. A person had to make the conscious decision to recreate what we just do naturally. Another puppet I love just as much is Deet, who has a lot of the same great attributes. The big eyes obviously play a part in helping her be expressive while having little eye movement, and she has the exact same kind of eyebrows as Brea. But what I think her puppet has over all of the other Gelflings is specifically her mouth. It still has the same limitations as the others, but either they gave her extra articulation in the corners of her mouth, or they used some very seamless CG. However subtle, instead of just having that midway expression, you can see her mouth change between a smile and a frown constantly. Sadly, not every puppet gets this treatment. And I don't mean Rianne, the technical aspects of his puppeteering is still just as good. But what I'm saying is that there are puppets that must just not have had the same amount of animatronics. I'm not just talking about the background characters though, which is completely understandable. You can't have the same amount of detail in each of the 88 different Gelflings they designed. But take this guy from episode 6, from the Doosan clan. Don't remember his name, and I don't care. But he is a minor supporting character for a while. As interesting and well conceptualized his design is, the actual animatronics inside the puppet just weren't as intricate. They couldn't have been because I refuse to believe that one of their master puppeteers would give us a performance like this if it weren't for technological limitations. His eyes never move more than like a centimeter and his eyebrows may as well not move at all. So his eye line just moves with his head like an owl, which is so unnatural that we can't help but notice even more how uncanny his lip flapping is and how it doesn't sink to what he's saying and how his mouth doesn't close completely. Just gah. You need something else in the face to distract us when you can't get the mouth to move correctly. Luckily, only a few characters are like this, and honestly, the story has me so engrossed that for many scenes it never even crosses my mind, and I don't notice the uncanny things like this until I'm looking for it. Now, this script is almost 10 pages long. I've already got about 7 more pages written, but I'm going to blow up my voice and burn myself out completely if I try to fit all of this into one video. In part two, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into Age of Resistance plot, theme, the Skeksis, and more character analysis. Please, if you haven't seen Age of Resistance and this got you at all interested, go watch it now. Like, right now. If you don't have Netflix, go get a one month free trial. What's stopping you? Oh, you already did it? Make another email. You can't make excuses. Steal your friend's password. I don't care. The second video is going to be spoilers galore. So seriously. Experience the series twist and turns for yourself. It's one wild ride, and you deserve to take that journey. Until next time. Fuck, I wrecked the fuck! <laughs> I'm waving my hands around in this cramped closet. I'm fucking sweating up here. I'm not gonna just. <laughs>